The names gather, seagulls gather, and today I am reviewing a new weapon invented by Q Branch. It is a new kind of weapon that when trained on an ailing franchise, that's franchise with this definition, it produces an ailing franchise by this definition. It can, on a lower setting, turn a rainbow of colour into the beigest of beige. This book was written by Charlie Higson, the absolute legend behind the BBC smash hit, The Fast Show. Higson has also produced, outside of the Bond series, a dozen or so other novels. And in terms of timescales, this book was written in the middle of them. It came out in 2005. It is set between the wars and it follows little orphan Jimmy, who is studying at Eton. He's bullied by an American called George Hellebore. Never has there been a more apt character name in a book. He takes part in a tournament arranged for George to win and stops George from winning it. Then he heads back to Scotland, the land of permanent winter for spring break. He meets the artful Dodger who calls himself Red in this and he's heading north to investigate his brother's disappearance. There they discover George and Daddy Hellebore have bought a Scottish lordship and are rather lording it up. Bond lives with a terminally ill Uncle Max who teaches him to drive. Then he teams up with Red to investigate the Hellebore castle. They bump into a Pinkerton detective who's doing something similar. He immediately ends up dead. Red and Bond break into the castle by stowing away on a truck. They discover that Hellebore is performing evil experiments with a Nazi, no less, to produce the serum from Captain America which is disappointingly not called Preparation H. Bond is captured, escapes, is chased by Hellebore Sr., but then helped by Hellebore Jr. to return to the castle and destroy the lab, Sr. H being killed by his own monstrous creations. And if you've gone from Harry Potter to Resident Evil in the last two minutes, then you got there a hell of a lot quicker than the creator of The Far Show did, which is probably ironic. This book is very strange. It is clearly intended for a young adult audience, but I struggle to see what part of a young adult audience would actually like this. Certainly the minuscule plot dragged out across nearly 400 pages is too predictable. And the most interesting thing that happens in the first 150 of those pages is a cross country race. So a young boy from the can't read, won't read club will have absolutely nothing there to change his mind. Not just that, but the between war settings is as creative decisions go strange. While this came out between the last Pierce Brosnan movie and the first Daniel Craig, the only people that could make any sense of the time setting would be Sean Connery fans. And they would have to have not read a book or seen a film since Doctor No to not find this predictable and worse, boring. Waiting another year, the publishers could of course told the story of young Daniel Craig, but that movie would be set some 60 years later. Imagine, if you will, the creative thought processes here. We have the potential to write about James Bond as a young man and create an exciting story that young boys will love. When can we set it? Pierce Brosnan would have been a young man in the late 1960s. How about Bond at Woodstock? Daniel Craig would have been a young man in the 1980s. And we will be releasing his first film next year. Can we see Bond in Frankie Goes to Hollywood? Maybe we need something a bit more action-packed and boys do like the war. So let's set it in that bit between them. What's that called? Peace. Bond needs peace like chickens need 11 secret herbs and spices. But surely if you write Hellebore through him a dirty look, you're aiming for a young reader, someone who might not respond well to a more challenging word like scowl or glower. Okay, so they're not that much more challenging. They're just more interesting. James came out into what must have been a servant's passageway, long and thin and twisting. He belted along it as quickly and as quietly as he could. I'm ignoring the wince-inducing triplet as best as I can because belted along. Who is this book aimed at? Because if you read regularly, even at 12, you'll think that's not very good. But if you don't, isn't the purpose of encouraging reading to improve people's ability to read and write, to help them understand the difference between registers? Is that really what we write in our novels these days? When you see this written out in this way, Max launched himself into another horrible storm of coughing. So I may as well cough, enjoy myself cough while I can. You know you're dealing with writing of a certain standard, we'll say, because it's certainly never more than a lick above 
bog. Do we need these coughs here like this? What does that convey other than he's coughing? But that's a very broad term. Use a dialogue tag to break up your speech. If your book is 370 pages long, you're not concerning yourself with brevity. Describe that cough. Is it wet or dry? Does it rack up through the body? Are we using a word for more than just the bog standard dictionary definition? Does he spit up because Max is dying but the word cough can mean? <clears throat> and you're a pretty poor writer if you can't give us more than this. The book is too slow and too dull to change the mind of reluctant to read boys, most of whom will have dozed right off the page and back on a TikTok before Bond has even unpacked his valise. Anyone with enough staying power to move beyond that will find nothing for them here because if you read regularly, you will have read better. Higson, I desperately hope, is reigning in his prose, looking for that audience that his tedious story will alienate. His book isn't so much as badly written, it's more not written at all. The poetic function is something authors do. It is when we use a word for something other than its literal meaning, at its best it creates imagery and emotional resonance. For example, the engine woke up and howled like an angry lion. Higson personifies the engine with the human behavior of waking. Then we have this simile here of it howling like an angry lion, except do angry lions howl? Do any lions howl? Do engines howl? Is this a typo because he meant to write growl? So you have this word here, but even that is in service of crying and wailing. The connotations, the things we associate with the word are at odds with the intended goal, which is why we need this word here, even though it is in the definition of the word here. I put it to you that by understanding the poetic function, the author could have used either of these two options and saved ink in the process. The engine woke up and growled like a lion. The engine woke up and growled. I'm pretty sure that lions don't howl. I'm fairly certain that engines in the 1920s and 30s didn't either, but in Higson's world they do. It's harder to claim it's a mistake because on a road that is deeply rutted and meandered over the moors in a lorry that is so much bigger and heavier than anything James has driven before, Bond's truck howled off down the road. Maybe you think I'm being too hard on Hicks and this is just a slightly misjudged simile and the rest of his prose is up there with the likes of Fitzgerald and Conrad. His pupils were very wide and very black, like two deep black holes. This chair is comfortable like a comfortable chair. Is it even a simile if you say something is black like black? You might feel it is, but unless it's a joke, I feel it's shameful. Inside the lorry it was dark and stuffy and crammed with sacks of something knobbly. There's no malevolent shadows building claustrophobia, no foreshadowing that Bond will, in a hundred pages or so, be swimming through a dark, tightening tunnel, desperately trying to escape the Hellebore Castle. Just the bland, beigeous prose you've ever read. Sacks of something knobbly. What are they, you might wonder? Turnips. Uncle Max just told a story about how he escaped capture in the First World War on a barge full of turnips. So Higson either understands foreshadowing or he's just seen it somewhere, because what is the emotional payoff here? The turnips might as well be house bricks. But this is so typical of the way this novel is written. It is the beigest of beige. They swung the door shut above their heads and James got out the torch and switched it on. They were in a forgotten cellar. It was clean and dry and apart from a shelf of empty glass flasks and a row of ancient barrels, it was empty. Riveting stuff. You can really picture that place for yourself. Can't you feel that cold, the haunting emptiness, ancient mysteries as old as Scotland itself, the bursting into textuality with Jekyll and Hyde in those discarded scientific antiques? Or is it just 50 empty words in a novel full of similar passages? Beige Bond would be bad enough, but Higson needs to explain how an internal combustion engine works over three pages. Bond learning to drive is, vicariously, about as exciting as sitting your theory test. There's another three pages gone. All the time that one simple but terrible word kept repeating in his head. Dead. He hadn't realised at the time how final that word was, how two people so familiar to him that he'd taken so much for granted that his thought would always be there, simply weren't there anymore, and would never be there again because they were dead. I don't know about you, but this level of quality writing, really turning that emotional screw on a reader, is choking me up. How about a bit of breaking and entering into a guarded, isolated and imposing Scottish castle, decaying around you full of dangers, real and imagined? That sounds amazing, unless you write like this. 
They trotted over, pushed down a section of chicken wire and picked their way through the rubbish towards the building. It was made of dirty red bricks and was covered in ivy and moss. All the windows were smashed and only one story of it was still standing. The door was padlocked shut, but the wood was so rotten that they easily levered it away from the screws with a penknife. They tried to open it without too much noise, but a sharp creak suddenly echoed into the night as its rusted hinges complained. They froze. To them the noise had sounded as loud as an explosion, but they saw nobody, and nobody came. All that happened was another light went off in the castle. The first thing Higson does here ensures that his description will fail, trotted, pushed and picked three verbs all about the blandest you could pick none of them imply anything other than a walk in the park rather than a furtive sneak through an enemy's castle they sneaked over wrenched down a section of chicken wire and tiptoed their way through the rubbish towards the building it isn't a lot better but at least now we have three verbs that convey something about the way the action is being carried out to be fair trotter does as well if you compared it to something like walking for example but does it convey danger or stealth it was made of jagged flint and crumbling cement covered with a ragged veil of poisonous old ivy and grey moss. Words like jagged and poisonous have negative connotations. They evoke images of danger and violence. Crumbling, ragged are signs of neglect and decay. Like old and grey, the connotations are of death. It brings a picture of threat. The original does nothing. Then we've got easily. Get rid of that. Nothing about this should be easy. It should be a place of peril. Rusty hinges complained. Oh, Charlie, this is the one place that you should have used howled. This final sentence is what happens when you let people write books when their only qualification is watching films. Because in a film, after the noise, you cut to a wide shot and show the limit and the effect of the sound. But in a book, this is a distancing device. We're moving away from our protagonists, and at best, that takes us away from the danger. If the author isn't trying to create some sort of feeling with their words, why are they writing at all? I could go on about the indulgences of terrible Bond cliches, bad guys explaining their plot, inexplicably moving prisoners out of a place with perfectly good cells to a more remote one so they can escape, that the bad guy unties Bond to show him his nefarious plan and then ties him up again shortly afterwards to inject him with the super soldier serum. There's a potential for some canon breaking there too. Is Bond good at what he does in all those other books and films simply because of the genetic boost that the bad guy gives him? here. Why does Bond do so much for Queen and Country when he hates England? The next stop is York. How dull those names sounded. James pictured all those grey English towns whizzing past with their rows of little houses. How much more exciting it would be to be travelling through Europe. How much more romantic those names would sound. Paris, Venice, Budapest, Istanbul. Except, of course, York is an incredibly ancient city loaded with culture and important to the history of Britain and Europe. But why would an eaten educated twit know anything about that? How drab England was, how safe and solid and dull it all seemed. Dishforth, Leeds, Doncaster, Stevenage, Hatfield. A dreary parade of colourless places where nothing ever happened. For Queen and Country, James... In conclusion, this book is as dull as Dishforth. The plot would be reasonable for a 45-minute TV special, but stretched out to 370 pages here, it is a drag, especially when Hickson resorts to obvious filler. It might have seemed like a good idea to show us where Bond got his love for cars, but if you copy and paste from the internal combustion engine's Wikipedia page, you must know that it will be short on passion and excitement. Higson, I pray to God, is deliberately writing down to an audience I think is very unlikely to read this book, and in doing so will likely turn away the early teens who do read and will most certainly have been exposed to better books with better stories than this. Bond as a representation of the boy who will grow up to be a spy is perfectly mediocre, but the sermons from Max's life and the brief meeting with the Pinkerton detective may have whet the youngster's appetite for the spying life, but it was all deadly dull to me. As mentioned, I hope that Higson has written in the way he has to make this book as accessible as possible to young people who are reluctant readers, because this is some of the least interesting prose I've ever had the misfortune to wade through, and I'd rather wade through Hellebore's polluted and mutant Elan infested lock then read this again or anything else in this series the name's bond bloody boring bond so you stay to the end do you remember this i wonder if a bentley continental gt is a really nice car more so than just an entry-level bentley or even a non-gt bentley continental 
I wonder because Diva makes a point of using the full brand name as much as possible. That's him, the Bentley, a Continental GT. Now that's a bloody fine automobile. I think they reviewed it on Top Gear. Now I wonder what sort of cars Bond's family were driving in those between wars years. Aunt Charmian had her own car there, a heavy four and a half litre four cylinder supercharged Bentley four seater sports car. James loved it and had decided that if he ever owned a car, it would be this model. I don't know what it's doing to the suspension driving up and down here all day, said Charmian as she wrestled with the wheel to negotiate a particularly tight bend, but they're pretty well built, these Bentleys, thank God. And the good people of Bentley for ponying up the dough, of course. Though they're not getting much in the way of words per dollar here, perhaps we'd better shoehorn in another reference just to help. I drove like a madman up to the castle in the Bentley. Well, that's not contrived at all then. 